Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to Career Lab. Um, you're here to see your mentors interview each other, and it's going to be loads of fun. Um, before we jump into that, it'll just be a minute. I want to do a quick check-in with the calendar and see where we're at. So you guys should have finished week one, hopefully, um, and gotten your LinkedIn all beautiful um, and gotten some feedback with Randy on Tuesday. If you're not done, if you haven't already met with your interview uh, with your mentor to go over your LinkedIn, do that as soon as you can, um, just because you want to get that piece on the side so that you can get to the meaty week of two, week two and the interviews. So we're going to start today. We're going to watch mentors interview each other. So you're going to get to see, you know, what you might expect in an interview and what answers work and get the feedback as well. Um, I'll bet most of you have already taken a look at the mock um, assignment, the take-home assignment, but if you haven't, start today officially, take a look at it, um, clone it, and then you have a mentor that you're going to go over it with at some point. So if you haven't already figured out who that is, um, and EJ's here today, so Helen and Andrew, definitely make sure you yell at them if you haven't already yell nicely, like, hi, <laughs> I would love to meet with you. Um, so definitely get that done quick if you haven't already gotten on their calendar. Um, then there is a video and you're gonna see Chris today doing this live, um, but he's got a whole session on how to rock the technical. So watch that too before you meet for your mock interview. Um, the pair interview, it says it's sync on Monday. You can do that whenever works for you. This is supposed to be a very low risk chat, casual, you know, you could pretend you're doing flashcards with each other, asking a couple of questions and then practicing your answers. Um, but if you haven't gotten with your group yet and picked a day that works for everybody, or if you need to chop up your group into two pairs instead of a trio, um, that's fine, whatever works for you. But try and do that again before the interview. Um, and then you're gonna have your technical mock and which I already looked at, and the job fit mock. So these are the mentors whose calendar, it's just Andrew and Yolanda. So whoever you're assigned to, if you haven't already talked to them, definitely reach out um, quickly because we're running out of time, it's almost over. Um, smack dab in the middle is an awesome session Wednesday with Luke about navigating your finances If once you start this new career. Um, and then that's it, that's it for Career Lab. So the Sunday the 11th, is um, graduation from Career Lab, but also Collab Lab. You can celebrate the 10 weeks that you've spent um, doing all this awesome stuff and give us feedback, um, any last minute questions, show up, have fun and celebrate you and what you've done. Okay, without further ado, let's stop sharing. There we go. So um, we're going to go with job fit first. I think if Lindsay and Stacey, are you guys ready? Okay, cool. I'm going to get quiet. Take it away. Excellent. Okay. And scene. Let's pretend we're going into this interview. Hi, Lindsay. Good to meet you. Thanks for coming to this inter job fit interview at Zapier. Um, so the way this is going to work today is I'm going to ask you a really standard set of questions that we ask everybody. And we keep them all the same like this to help reduce any bias. Um, and whenever you're responding to these questions, if you can give some specific examples, that'll help really fill your stories out a lot better. And once we get done with these questions, I'll give you a couple minutes to ask any questions you might have for me. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Excellent. Okay. So let's start by just having you tell me a little bit about how you got into web development. Yeah, definitely. So before I was into web development, I did have a different career. I held roles in the financial industry and the insurance industry. And in all of those roles, I was always searching for a way to make a bigger impact and have more responsibility. But it really seemed like the way to progress is just years of experience grinding it out. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really something I was interested in waiting for. I wanted to find ways to improve processes and execute um, and make a big improvement. So um, I moved into a temporary role in 2019. I had the opportunity to work on the campfire remediation project. So the 2018 campfire burned down the town of Paradise, California, many homes destroyed. Um, and so I moved into a role there doing data quality insurance um, and had a little intro to SQL. 
it was really fulfilling work because of the impact I was having on people. Um, but it was temporary because uh, we cleaned up uh, the sites and my contract ended. After that project, I continued learning SQL and I realized I was more interested in hands-on building things. And so that led me to a full stack software engineering bootcamp. And um, I've progressed to where I am today. That's fantastic. That's really great. Um, I used to live in Paradise, California a couple of years before it burnt down. So that's really fantastic that you guys work on that project. Yeah. Incredible. Um, so what, tell me a little bit about what you're looking for in your next opportunity. Yeah. Um, in my next opportunity, obviously I've talked about impact already. So I'm definitely interested in a role where I can make an impact either on users and building accessible web pages, um, functionality, user experience. Those are things I like to focus on. Also in code base, writing clean, reusable components. Um, so that we're not having to maintain a lot of different pieces of code um, when it can be more uh, simple and easier to maintain. Um, I also like learning opportunities and uh, working with tech I'm unfamiliar with and a team that is supportive of that and supportive of knowledge sharing. And then finally, I'm looking for a team that is proactive with communication, prevents siloing, and a team that seeks feedback to improve processes and, retros and is retrospective about the work that we're doing. Fantastic. Sounds like you thought a lot about this next opportunity. That sounds really great. Excellent. Um, tell me a little bit about the work that you've done that you're most proud of. Obviously, I have to say the campfire because of the impact I had on people who have lost so much. Um, I want to focus on software engineering. So the software engineering work I'm most proud of was the work I did on an open source project called the Collab Lab. I worked with a team of developers, um, four developers, to build a four stack a full stack application over the course of eight weeks. We worked in one week sprints and just seeing the way that our app progressed in functionality and the user interface week after week was so amazing and fulfilling. Um, I also really appreciated how collaborative our team was. Um, we did peer programming. We did a lot of peer reviews where everyone would give feedback. Um, I really liked the peer programming and being able to bounce ideas with another developer and have that time. Um, we always came to better implementations than either one of us could do alone. Um, so that was also really great. One of the big pieces that I focused on on this project was CSS architecture and that I introduced to my team. Um, so I had recently had experience with Tailwind and we were deciding what CSS style to use like vanilla or a framework. And um, I had finished my issue early um, so this was before we had gotten to that point where we needed to make a decision. I really wanted to implement CSS style, so I brought up to the team, hey, I recently used Tailwind. There's a little bit of um, time to get into it, but it's really fast to work with once you take those couple days to practice with it. Um, and so if everyone's open to it and wants to try it, if you haven't tried it before, we could do Tailwind. And my team was really on board with it. So I was able to install it in the project weeks before we were going to have to make that decision and start on the styling, which gave everyone time to get used to it. So that's one piece I'm really proud of for that project, taking on styling ahead of time and then setting up a framework to give everyone an opportunity to learn something new. And um, everyone was really impressed how fast it was to do CSS functions and get into gradients and everything. And it was a great um, way to do the styling of the app. Fantastic. Yeah, there's nothing like having a really good team experience and getting to really share some of that knowledge with your team. I love that. So when you're working on a team, can you tell me about a time that you've dealt with some conflict? Tell me how the conflict was solved, how you handled the situation, what you might do differently next time. On a project I joined, an open source project I joined before the Collab Lab while I was in my boot camp, um, it was called Hack for LA. It's a team of people who build applications to serve the local LA community. Um, I was working on the website for this project and we have a design system in place, a really great design team that builds a Figma mockup for us to then implement the designs. One of the designs did not follow our standard of 16 pixel font uh, for accessibility and when I'm doing this pixel perfect design, it just did not align with the, the Figma market to not match my version at all with 16.5 font. So I could not move forward to show this as my work to match the design. So I asked my lead what the process was for this when the design isn't complete and needs to be revised. Um, they sent me to the lead designer. This is an open source project. The lead designer was busy all week, was not able to get back to me, was not able to move this forward. So it got escalated at our sink. Um, and so 
the project manager ended up talking about it for like 20 minutes and going through the problem. It was a lot for a, what I saw as a small solution. Hey, we just need a designer to like, go like create an issue or some kind of process to rework this pixel design. Um, so as a conflict from it, I learned to maybe be a little bit more proactive in suggesting the resolution. Um, we didn't have a process in place. So also finding a process for this um, was also really important so that when this happens in the future, it doesn't have to get escalated at a meeting where there are 20 people and only three need to be involved in this conversation um, on, a, on a small scale issue. And then I also really wanted to work on my next issue, but I was blocked for my team lead said, no, I should resolve the stigma issue first. So yeah, that was a conflict. Um, I went with what my team lead said, retrospectively, I think now I would be a lot more active in suggesting the appropriate remediation steps for this issue, which is to talk to a designer that is available instead of the design lead, but our teams are split. So I would need to get into that design Slack channel and talk to someone directly. So I've reworked my processes after that, but that was an interesting conflict to have to go through. Yeah, it sounds like it. Great. Well, tell me about one of the biggest challenges you faced in your career and what you learned from it. So before the Campfire Project, I worked for an insurance company, really large company, 10,000 employees, 100 years old, that dealt with employer benefits. Um, and this is kind of where the impact that I'm talking about that I want to make probably <laughs> really sparked in my um level of importance of what I want to do. Um, so I'm working for this company, we handle employee benefits for leaves. And I saw this issue keep recurring, especially with leaves for pregnant people. Um, they would have to call to set up their initial leave, six weeks for giving birth, and then um, go through intake again to set up an additional six weeks leave for bonding time. Um, the issue that came is that either if they didn't call they could be unprotected for their bonding leave if they were taking it anyways and assuming that they were protected. If they didn't call to set it up, they would be unprotected. They could get fired from their job. If they called, there were really long wait times to go through and take two plus hours. I would see people get sent to this um, line to go through setting up this other leave when the solution was just asking them that first leave, are you planning to take an additional bonding leave? Would you like to be covered for additional bonding leave? After your initial six weeks, they could do that in the first call and then the team could set up the leave from that. I suggested this as a process change and I was met with another team would have to change their processes so we can't do it. And that was kind of unconscionable to me because I saw pregnant people like so many people, pregnant people every day have to go through this and then so many more that are probably uncovered. Um, so I was really not okay with that and so when I got this opportunity for the campfire I immediately left that role and joined the campfire. So it was kind of scary because I knew the campfire would be a temporary project. I'd have to figure something out after that um, but it eventually led me to where I am today. So really great decision. That's great. Yeah, that's such an important issue. I remember going through that process and it just being such a nightmare. And so like trying to like put your foot down and change it, I can see as being something that probably felt very noble and hitting roadblocks had to be very frustrating. Um, great. So um, let's do, I'll do one last question for me and then I'll give you a chance. Tell me about what you think the biggest challenge would be in this role that you're interviewing for right now? Um, so in general, this is also gonna come up right. Um, incomplete or ill-defined processes are a challenge, but I'm pretty set on finding, like once, once you get through it, finding the best way to define those processes and making it better for anyone who comes across those challenges after me. Um, one thing I wanted to discuss with you, this role mentions work in small teams, and I'm curious how that scopes the work and how does each member of the team get a greater context of the overall technology? Is that needed or does the structure work really well for your team? I'm curious about that because I'm not used to working in small teams. And I really love that greater contextual knowledge. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you work on smaller teams, but your team is going to own a really like tidy little piece of the puzzle. So there are other systems that will integrate with on a much larger scale that you will have to interact with from time to time. Um, but as far as like you learning what your team works on, it'll be a, a much smaller piece than okay. the overall architecture of what the entire company is doing. Um, generally, the way that work will be scoped is we'll be rolling out a new feature, for example, and the work will be broken down. And we work really collaboratively, especially in the beginning, if you were to be hired on, 
you'd work very closely with another engineer um, and pair on tickets, potentially taking some of your own and working on them and getting help. But we sync very often. So you'd never be left on your own to figure things out by yourself. And you have not just the people on your small team to leverage for information and understanding about how the systems work and what you need to be doing. But the entire company is very open and empathetic and eager to collaborate. So say you do need to work with something that de the design systems team is creating. They're more than happy to collaborate with you to make sure you have all of the understanding that you need, review your code, pair a program with you, which I know you mentioned is something that you really appreciated. So you'll gain a wider context throughout time just by interacting with the other engineers and the tools that we work with. But as far as your day-to-day -day work, it'll be very like scoped to the tools that your team works on. Does okay. that answer that? Yeah, it sounds like um, the teams are divided in a way where you don't have, you're not thrown into needing something from another subsection that's going to enter, take time to ramp up into, and you can really just deeply learn your scope area. Yeah, I would say the process would be a bit like, come learn the tools that your team works on. And when you do need to learn something that is outside of your team's scope, just lean really heavily into that collaboration, asking the questions, getting people, you know, on Zoom to pair through things and just learn what you need to to get the job done rather than understanding high level the entire system. Okay. So. And then other projects I worked on, um, it's either pair programming is really supported, there's time and space open for that, or it's not really supported. There's a, there's a lead that you can ask questions to, but you can't really pair with other teammates. They're working on their own issues. They don't, there's not time in the, in the week to pair with them. How does Zapier handle that? Do you leave time open? How, how does that work? Sure, yeah. So I'll have a ramp up plan for whoever takes this position. And because I'm very passionate about collaboration and pair programming, pair programming is something that will happen every single day until you feel comfortable moving on. You'll be paired up with somebody on the team on a weekly basis. So engineer A for the first week, engineer B for the second week, and you'll rotate through all of them so that you can build a relationship with them and have time on their calendar every day for synchronous pair programming. That doesn't mean that you won't be pairing with other people in that week too, but that's your space to do with it what you need, ask the questions that you need. And if you don't have questions, then you can just shadow them, watch what they're doing. Um, the team that I was working on before the one I'm on now, Loved collaboration so much that when we brought on somebody new, they all wanted to mob together every day. They were like, I don't want to be left out of the pairing. And so for just months, they collaborated. And still today, they spend most of their time working three engineers on a single ticket just to get things through. And that helps them like fully grasp the context of all the work that's happening and not feel like they're missing out and just learn together every day. So there will absolutely always be time and space for you to pair program and get the collaborative help that you need. Awesome. I really appreciate that you have time on the calendar. I find that if you don't set aside specific time for the things that are important, that subconsciously or consciously people become afraid of being yeah. a bug or a hassle and having that time really provides that space to do that comfortably for everyone. So I do really appreciate that. Exactly that. Do you have any other questions for me? That's only questions. Great. Well, it was really great to meet you and to talk to you today. Um, I gather up all my notes. I send them to recruitment and recruiting will be in touch with any next steps. Sounds great. Thank you, Stacey. Cool. Thank you, Lindsay. Have a great day. Thanks. And scene. Okay. We'll do, jump into the other interview next and then we'll do like questions, comments, things about them. So if you have them, write them down. You can put them in the chat or send your notes and we'll jump back into that. After the next one. Okay, so Chris and EJ, you both ready? Yep. Take it away. Cool. Uh, all right. Thanks for uh, taking some time out of your schedule today, EJ, to come chat with us about your uh, your technical application to our company and to uh, the exercise that you took home and completed. Um, I uh, We'll, we'll sit together and go through the exercise that you completed. Uh, I'll have you give me a little bit of a code tour of what you've done. Um, and then I'll have maybe some questions about your implementation um, and maybe some other things that you would do kind of moving into the future. Uh, does that sound good? Ooh, we can't hear you, EJ.
I was wondering if this would happen, but I didn't want to interrupt <laughs> earlier to figure out, okay, can you hear me now? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, there Sorry we go. about that. <laughs> all good, all good. This is a, a, a definitely a simulation of real things that would happen out in the, in the technical interview over Zoom. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, so your next technical challenge is can you share your screen in Zoom for us so that you can uh, share Let's the code hope. with us? <laughs> let's, let's, let's really hope, given how this is going so far, right? Um, <laughs> all right, um, everybody cross your fingers. Can we see a GitHub window at the yes. very least? Okay. Yes, looks good. We're going to call that a, a success. I'm going to move it over to the side here. I've got my code and I've got GitHub on one side with the app already open in another tab. Um, how would you like me to do this? Should I just kind of walk you through and you can stop me whenever? Do you have specific questions? What would work best for you? Yeah, um, I, I think what would be great is if you could kind of walk me through commit by commit, like what your process was and how you approached the work um, and then uh, also, yeah, feel free to kind of demo, you know, where you were able to get with the app uh, in the end too. I think both would be yeah. useful. Sure. I started by kind of trying to internalize what the AC in the, in the assignment were asking of me and to decide what would be the most important things to get done with the time I had. Because I, I know that the, the uh, readme said to spend one hour on this. And we know that, you know, as we're working on projects, you know, we might always have time to finish the whole thing in, in an hour. So I was thinking, what would someone want to see if they're they looking at this with me? What's the most important thing? And I thought, you know, I want to render stuff. So let's get let, let's get the list shown. Let's get the images shown. And I can show you that here. Um, right now, it only shows cats, no matter what we do, as, it, as, was, as was provided in the starter, because I didn't have time to do the API thing. But the list of links with their uh, artist does show up. And I can click them. And I get to the prototype of the full page that shows the artwork. It's not quite done yet. And I can go back. So there's some things I didn't quite get to because I didn't have enough time. But I'd be happy to talk about those and how I would do them or anything else. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure, sure, yeah. Um... I definitely appreciate the the walkthrough and what you were able to get done so far, and it's great that we're able to fetch some data from the API and render that out, and at least see you know some of the details about the data. Um, so, if you were going to uh, take this project and keep working on it, um, what would for you be the most important features? Like, what what order would you tackle that in in terms of uh, finishing it out? Yeah, I think the fact that we can't quite see the actual art on these pages is pretty important, um, and. The code is just about ready. It's one of those things where you're so close to getting it implemented that I just didn't have time to do it. It's over here in the details page file. Um, I have a note to myself to use the URL format that was mentioned in the readme to get to take the ID, put it in, in an image tag, and show it up. Um, and when I do that, I want to be careful to also get the uh, other information about the image, like its size and um, the alt attribute, which describes the image, so that visually impaired users or users whose connections are, are broken, can still see something about the image. And from there, I would want to go back into the code and actually use the real API that was mentioned um, in the assignment. And I have a note to myself here as well for the URL that I would use. But I wanted to avoid using it until I had everything done, because there was a mention that the API um, wouldn't appreciate us hitting it with requests until we were really done and ready to start using it. And that's that's it, I think. There are some things I would do as stretch goals, but I want to make sure that you have, don't have any questions before I talk about those. Yeah, no, that that all makes sense. Thank you. Um, although, you know, arguably it, we should, you know, check if our users really need to search for anything other than cats, because I mean, what else would you want to see, right? But <laughs> that's a very um, good point. <laughs> yeah, no, that that totally makes sense for me. Um, so uh, I'm curious. What did you find to be uh, the most challenging about this exercise? And uh, I'm curious if you would have changed any of your approaches uh, on how you tackled that, like, you know, with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah, you know, I, I'm so used to uh, using React Router to render stuff conditionally based on what's happening in the app that I got really hung up on uh, not using it because it was specifically mm, mentioned yeah. as out of scope for the assignment. And I was like, how do I, how do I render something uh, conditionally? That the logic there took me a second to think about, and that's where I lost some time. But I did, you know, some googling. I looked at the React docs, which are very helpful, and I figured it out. But it just kind of showed me that I I spend so much time in like developed apps that have tools in place that I sometimes forget some of the some of the things that do things differently. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. That that's a really uh, good thought, and that leads me actually to another question here. So you know, let's assume that you've got the app finished, you've implemented those features that you told us about. 
Um, so from your perspective and just, you know, from your experience as a developer, what do you think are some of the changes that you would make to the overall structure and architecture of the app? Like what are some of those tools and maybe processes that you would bring in to continue to improve it? Yeah, um, from a like developer experience standpoint, I would maybe want to reorganize my components a little bit because we have this concept mm -hmm. of individual components going on, but we also have the concept of pages coming in, like an image details page is this new concept we're putting in with this feature. And I think that equally, we could turn some of this existing app code into its, its own page. Like this code I'm highlighting here could be the home page. And that way, we've got a clear delineation between the, the pseudo pages of the app until until we do start rendering with React Router, if that makes sense. Yeah. Totally. Um, other things, as far as features, I would probably, again, move on to React Router if we, if, if we find out that we're doing a multiple different kinds of conditions and rendering, because it's just a lot easier to have React Router or something like it do all that work for us at scale. Um, but in terms of features, I guess it depends on what the goals are of this app. Like, what it, what is the user meant to do with this information? Is it purely social? Are they trying to learn? Because if they're, if they're trying to learn and you know learn about the artwork that they can see, we'd also want to bring in more data about the artwork and the artist to help them learn about the piece itself. Like. I, from what I can tell, we could also, in theory, look up more uh, how do you use biographical detail about the artist, like where they were born, where they worked, and where they you know where they died, and things like that. Yeah, nice. I, I love that you also think about that kind of from a product perspective too. Of like, you know, what what improvements do we actually need to make to this app for the user? So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great to see. So, so I've kind of heard from you like organizationally how we would change the app. I've also kind of heard your thoughts on like where we could take this as a product. Um, I, I'm also curious, how would you um, anticipate scale challenges in the future with this app? Like, let's say that we needed to support, uh, you know, potentially having thousands of users requesting it at once, uh, you know, during the course of a day. Uh, what sort of actions would you take to make this app be able to scale in production like that? Ooh, um, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, there's so many <laughs> things we'd want to consider if we're scaling up. Like, the first thing that comes, that comes to mind is being polite to our APIs that we're consuming. Mm, yeah. Because this is an open source public um, education API. Um, I assume that they don't have the most robust servers, and they probably wouldn't appreciate us with our millions of users hammering their API every single day. Right. Um, so we would want to work with them and, and read their docs and see what the rate limits are and try to um, write our own code that if, if we approach those limits, we would render some fallback data at least um, to the user so that they see something or, or, or at least explain why the API isn't available at a given time if we can't help to drive down our costs to them, if that makes sense. Yeah, like some kind of loading placeholder, let them know, like, you know, try again or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And on the note of, of trying to drive down the cost that we incur to the API, we could try to be careful about caching stuff so that if users, um, let's say someone's doing homework about cats, right? Um, and they keep, they, they keep looking for cat art to, to talk about the, you know, the history and composition of. But if they keep kind of going and coming back to these cat results, we could cache the results that they've gotten from about cats earlier because it's not likely that the data will change. So if they're looking for cats over the course of several days over and over again, they can just keep getting the cache that they already have, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what sort of caching mechanisms do you think you would look into for this kind of application? Well, um, if I were working in a production context with a team, I would probably bring in Axios, which I believe has its own caching mechanism. Um, or, or allow you to opt in. I'm not really sure. But if I were going to build a cache from scratch, um, I would think of making maybe an in-memory map that uh, uses the key, the key uh, uses the user search terms as keys, and maybe the uh, API results as values, and then looks up, you know, uses looks looks for those query keys, and then renders from the cache if they exist, and then if not, you know, does the actual API call. Cool. Yeah. So kind of create maybe some either your own in-memory cache or utilize a client that can just do mm -hmm. that for you. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Great. So uh, to kind of change directions here a little bit. So, you know, we, we've talked about, OK, our app is working. We've got all the features and we've done some stuff in production to make it scale and things are going great. 
we're making lots of money. People are searching for lots of cat images. It's going great. Or, or maybe we're not learn making any money at all. Maybe people are just learning a lot, right? That's, that's valuable mm -hmm. too. Um, but let's say that suddenly, you know, you're getting reports from users that the page is just uh, a complete blank page. They're not able to access the application. Something's gone wrong. So could you walk me through, like, how would you approach that problem? How would you debug that and you know what kind of tools and techniques would you use to, to figure out what's going wrong in that scenario? Yeah, I guess that depends partly about uh, on what tools we have in place in production. Um, we might have user monitoring, we might have bug monitoring systems or observability systems in place. But if we don't, mm. I go with the old fashioned open up the console on a production app and see if there are any errors in the console that tell me anything interesting. Um, and hopefully the answer to that is yes, and that gives us a, a starting point to start digging. Right. Let, let's say that maybe if I search for cats and nothing happens, um, I might be seeing a network request error maybe in the in the in the console log, and I, so I know that the problem isn't necessarily me as the author of this app, but maybe the Art Institute's API is tired from all of our awesome sales, and they need a break. Right? And we haven't handled that properly or something like that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... So we could, you know, check on the network tab. We could check on the console. Um, mm -hmm. You also mentioned uh, like tracking tools. Th those are all great. Um, so let's say that we, you know, we discover that it's not actually a problem with the API, um, but users, when they request our page, like it's just getting like a 500 error and, and mm -hmm. nothing at all is coming back. Like where would you go kind of from there? Uh, I guess that depends on my purview within the app. Uh, if I was on the team that deployed it, I might have the guts to go look at what parts of the of the the app lifecycle do the deploy. And maybe when when I ship the new feature, maybe the deploy didn't happen correctly because of something that was wasn't caught in our tool in our tooling. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe there's something wrong with you know other parts of the of the system that serve like our CDN where where it's cached or whatever. Um, I'm not really a DevOps person, so I'm not super familiar with what I might do, um, hypothetically speaking. But you know, again, if I were on the team that did deploy this app, if it was small enough, I would probably be able to figure it out in the in the actual context of which, in which I was working. Cool. Yeah, I know that. I, I like that you called out that it, it does kind of take guts to do that, but uh, it's also good to know that you know you'd be willing to do that in in the situation where it's an app you're familiar with. So. Um, so I'm curious uh, to kind of get your take on this, and this is going to be a bit of a meta question, but you know, as developers, we all sort of um, come to a new project uh, or a new application with a set of uh, requirements that are kind of enforced. Like they're just the app is this way, and we can't really do a lot about it. Coming to this application and the boilerplate that you received, uh, I'm curious, like, what about it would you change, if anything? Um, yeah. So. Uh... I think I think it's a great challenge. First of all, I like that it, it reflects some things I've done on pre at previous jobs. You know, like getting getting data from somewhere else and rendering it to the users and having conditions where where the app will behave differently depending on what's happening. Um, but if I were to bring it, bring, come in and sort of change this for future future um, interviewees, I would want to see maybe more accessibility in the criteria for the app because it's something that's very mm -hmm. important to me and it's something that I think that we should be building in as as core stakes for our application. Mm -hmm. um, as I was looking through the AC and thinking about what it asks of the developer, I didn't see any mention of what happens for the user when we navigate between the image details page and the list page. How do we know? How does how does every user know that that navigation has happened, and how do we handle that? And that's one of the stretch goals I had for this. If I had more time, but I got caught up, like I said. Totally. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really interesting direction uh, for us to take our questioning here. Actually, so let's say that. You know, we've launched the app, and next week your product owner is like, "Oh no, we forgot accessibility. It's not accessible, mm -hmm. and we need to make it accessible." Uh, this week, I just need you to make it accessible, EJ. What's your What's your process here? How do you break that down? How do you prioritize what's important to solve? Um, kind of walk me through that for you. Yeah, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it's similar to any kind of bug priority you do, where you want to know what your team standards are for what is high priority. Let's call that P zero. Like mm -hmm. stop all the presses. That everything everyone needs to fix this right now. This is a five alarm fire, right? And going from P zero to let's say P five, um, and I would go through what what I see to be wrong with the app or you know incomplete with the app and do the P zero through through P five assignment. And I would say that if we have three days, every P zero has to be has to be figured out, right? Because P zero is like. A user cannot complete this task in any situation that would allow them to, you know, understand what the app is doing and what it asks of them. And P5 is like, 
they can do this, but it's a it's a little bit weird, right? You know? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So you, so you break it up into some priority levels. So how how would you kind of go about discovering those those issues, and what would you be looking for? Oh yeah. Um, first thing I always like to do is even just use the keyboard to make sure that I can complete tasks. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because some users don't use pointer devices at all. Um, pointer devices being mice, or let's say you're using a smartphone screen, that's also a pointer because your finger is the pointer device. Um, if if we can't use the keyboard, um, we have almost certainty that someone who uses this technology can also complete can also not complete any tasks on the app because AT works very much the same way as a keyboard does in terms of the metaphors for how it navigates um, applications. And from there, I would actually go to using three meters and pairing them up with different different browsers that they're commonly paired with to see what they report as the app um, is used and. I sort of, when I saw the AC and saw what I was doing as built with building this, this app, I realized that we weren't accounting for routing and navigation, like I mentioned earlier. So I predicted that happening, but I'm sure there are other things I wouldn't have predicted that could also be, be improved. Yeah, it makes sense. So um, another question that I'm curious about um, is if you, you know, we, we fixed the app, it's accessible now, it's great, and, and people are able to use it. And now we've been so successful that we're going to scale up and hire a bunch of people. So now, you know, we went from you kind of building this app on your own. And now I need you to work on this app with like a team of about like 10 people or something. What do you change about this app or this repo or anything to help um, deal with needing to collaborate with that many people in a code base? Yeah, I, I want to make sure that I give them access in whatever channels are appropriate to the information they need to learn on their own as much as possible, mm -hmm. while also making it clear that the team is available for help. Um, I just know that some people have different pr preferred learning styles. And if you prefer to learn on your own, we want to have a bunch of docs that you can go through and feel confident and ask questions about those rather than being required to ask of someone else's time, because I know that can be very nerve wracking. It is for me. Um, and you know, from there, I want to make sure that as far as the content, we want to make sure the content includes uh, stuff about how to, how to build the app, how to make a pull request to the app, what our standards and practices are, um, talked about accessibility because we care about that and not everyone really might know about it. We want to make sure that they have the tools to learn about it so that they can be up to speed with our with our standards and those kinds of things. <laughs> totally, yeah, documentation is for sure critical. Uh, that's, a, I think, a really great place to start. Um, let's, let's go a little deeper, though. Like, what kind of um, changes to the actual code base, you know, would you make, if anything? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for elaborating. I, I might have gotten off track there. Um, no, you started great. I love the documentation to answer. That's so, that's such a good place to start. But I think there's a lot more to explore too. So, yeah, um, I think that would come down to like developer experience. Like I mentioned earlier, when I was thinking about how I would reorganize the repo itself and the file architecture itself, um, mm -hmm. because as you're scaling um, with more and more people, I find that it's harder to it's harder to really strictly like enforce little things like where files go. You can't really live for that. You can't really like like stop them from committing a file placement position. As far as I know, if, if you know about something that, that lets that happen, I'd love to hear about it because I, that, would, that would be great for me. But I think if we created folders that clearly defined what parts of the logic go where, if we if we created what felt like you know logical organization decisions in the file tree, that would be one thing that would help us all find out where everything is. And we could also make sure that going back to the docs thing, each major directory has a readme, which can be used to explain the context of that particular directory and what that does and why it's there. Because um, it doesn't really help in my experience to have a bunch of rules and sort of a bunch of little places to go if, if, the, if the developer doesn't understand why, because they're just going to be stuck on why, why is it this way, and they would want to know why rather than being able to just do what we say. It doesn't feel good to be prescribed something without an explanation. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good observation. And I feel the same way about lint rules sometimes myself. It's like, why do I have to do this? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, uh, EJ, that's all the technical questions that I had for you on your exercise, but I just, just want to leave a few minutes open at the end here. If you had any questions for me about uh, our organization or what it's like working here or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've had a great discussion with other people so far in the process. So I don't have any questions for you, but talking to you, particularly as an engineer, I'd love to know what what is like an average day of your tasks on the team that you're on. Sure, yeah. So an average day for me, um, usually I'm you know checking in with the state of my team, and I'm I'm seeing like what are people working on. Does anyone need assistance with the tickets they're on? Does anyone need pairing? And I'll kind of put out some feelers and start there. 
Um, if everybody's kind of humming along and doesn't like need any direct intervention from me, um, then I'm looking at the JIRA board. I'm either picking up like whatever it was that I was working on yesterday or pulling in prioritized work that we've already refined and prioritized with our product owner. Um, so, you know, from there, I'm just kind of working the queue, uh, you know, shipping fixes, uh, doing bug fixes, new product features. Um, sometimes I'm also taking on spikes, doing research about like, how do we want to approach this particular technical problem or whatever. Um, and so a lot of my day is uh, coding, pairing with people on that code if I get stuck myself, um, and then also uh, doing code review, which is also a pretty significant chunk of, of my day. Um, and then, you know, throw in some meetings for, for flavor, um, and then also throw in a little bit of documentation um, and just kind of communicating out like, here's what I'm working on, here's what I'm running into. Um, sometimes that's synchronous, like in a stand-up meeting or working groups. Sometimes that's just asynchronous, like me posting uh, a blog post or um, something like that. So that's that's kind of like generally my my day to day. Wow, um, that sounds familiar with uh, to things I've already done. So that sounds great. Um, I, I like that you 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 mentioned tech checking on your teammates because I know that we, sometimes people don't really know how to ask for help, and it sometimes especially mm -hmm. if they're beginners or if they're early career. It, it feels like shameful to ask for help, but uh, you know, I personally think that it's, um, we all do it. Um, I ask for help all the time at my current job and that's just kind of how it is. If there are people who know something different than I do, that's totally okay. I'm glad to, to hear that your team understands that and appreciates that. Um, I would love to know, um, what is the process for scoping out a, like a new feature or a new product on your team? Do you work closely with the design team? Do you um, have a docs team that is enshrined at every stage as well when, when developing? Because I know you mentioned, you mentioned docs being really important. I, I think it's to both of us. So I'd love to know what that, that process is like. Go ahead. Yeah, good question. So from the first angle with the design stuff, I, I actually really like the iterative way that our team involves the whole team when it comes to design decisions. So um, frequently we'll do like design sprints or uh, like brainstorming sessions where uh, the designer and the product owner will kind of come to the group with a problem space uh, and they'll, they'll be like, okay, how do we enable the user to figure this part of the app out? Or how do we drive more engagement with this particular thing? And then we'll all kind of go off into like pairing groups and do like a quick five minute brainstorm and then come back with our ideas. Um, and then our designer will kind of shop those and kind of take the best ideas and, and maybe edit them and then turn those into wireframes. Um, and then uh, we also will sync up with them throughout the design process to um, continue to validate that, you know, what we're sort of imagining and cooking up from like the product and design perspective is going to be supported by the APIs that we have. And if it's not, then, you know, getting ahead of understanding what the data requirements are, what the infrastructural requirements are, you know, that those kind of things and try to get ahead of those um, if we can uh, earlier. It doesn't always work. Sometimes we only end up at the end and realize, oh, wait, the API didn't support that. And then we have to figure it out. But um, and then, you know, from there, we'll eventually end up at uh, higher quality um, like mockups, uh, not, I guess, mostly pixel perfect, although there's certainly some wiggle room and a little bit of kind of improvisational jazz you have to do as you figure out how to turn that design into the, uh, into the code. But uh, our designer on our team is really collaborative and loves to just pair directly with engineers and kind of go back and forth on designs, uh, which I really like. So that's, that's a little bit um, of, a, of a slice of kind of the, the design ideation process. And then you also had a question about the documentation. So mm -hmm. Our company doesn't have like a, a docs team necessarily. We do have an architectural uh, team and they are sort of in charge of uh, what we call the engineering index documentation. And they both um, curate that, but also encourage other teams to contribute to it um, at, at like a high level. So I, I think that's a really good part of like our overall company um, documentation approach. And then for our individual team, um, we also really try to just keep our readmes uh, extremely up to date and really robust and thorough. We've got um, like run books for all of the applications that we own, including common troubleshooting problems and stuff. Um, and I think what's really important to, to make sure that that stuff remains uh, fresh and, and good even as the application changes is every PR that we have, there's like a, a checklist of things to do. And one of those things is update the documentation or at least think about updating the documentation if you change mm -hmm. something that, that needs that update. And so I think we've just got like a really good culture of kind of keeping that stuff um, tidy and up to date on our team, so. That's great to hear. Thank you for answering. Um, I, I know we're almost at time for the interview. I want to respect your time and, and make sure you're good to go, but I don't have any other questions as well. So thank you so much for this. I, I've, I've enjoyed it. Cool, yeah. Thanks, CJ. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, 
I'll go ahead and, and call it here. And uh, hopefully, you know, you hear back from the recruiter after this. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And Yay. see, as Stacey's been saying. <laughs> That was awesome. Good way to end it. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so we've got some time, so, but that was a really nice little thing at the end to be aware of the time and to be a, uh, I liked how both of you did this too, a partner in the interview. I think it just sets a really good tone. No matter how experienced you are for the specific role, you're an adult and you're in it with them. And I think that just sets a beautiful tone of, you know, this is the kind of person I'll be when you work with me that like, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not afraid. I'm not so unknown about what's going on. I'm a full person and I can participate in this, this experience we're going to have. So I think that was great. Um, so Kalavis, do you have questions for them? Anything that stood out, anything um, that you want to steal and why go for it? Just jump on mic, we're ready for you. Just talk to us. No one, no one has feedback about my performance? Shame. No. Uh, I, I think Miro was oh, going to say. No, no, I, I just wanted to say that I, I noticed you were trying to uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, scrambling for my mouse. <laughs> I have a couple questions. Um, so, well, this is kind of more maybe for Lindsay's interview. Um, I was given feedback once that um during the interview that I shouldn't mention I was from a boot camp and just say that I like self-studied and I was wondering what people thought about it. I think in this environment, especially with Zappy or whatever experience is like they're very open to they want, you know, early career engineers or like career transitioning. But um I have given feedback that boot camp is like kind of this coin term that people aren't exactly open to yet and I was wondering what people think. I think it's totally fine to say you came from a boot camp. In fact, if I would prefer somebody say that almost over self-study because it's like they got a credential. Like not that self-study would be bad, but I'd be like, oh, you committed to something and completed something. So from my perspective, but as you said, like I work for a company that's totally open to that. So EJ. Um, I have so many thoughts. I'm not gonna turn this into, into a TED talk, but boy, could I. Um... I feel like it's worth filtering that feedback through the possibility of someone else's bias. Like there, there, it's true that some people and some teams might not be uh, open to boot camp graduates. Um, and if it's really important to you to get a given job, and you know that that that's risky, you could avoid mentioning it. But that's your decision. You, don't, you know, only you can decide what what jobs are best for you. Um, however, I would also like to just remind everyone here that. You don't need to work for companies that would treat that would treat you differently if you're a bootcamp grad. That that kind of bias is a signal for other kinds of problems that I would not personally want anyone I care about to be uh, involved with. But you know, money is also money in capitalism. So you get whatever jobs you you can get to get your footing in something. I totally support that. But I also want to remind you that you can do your best to make decisions that protect you from the kinds of harm that would come with biases like that. Um, that's that's the polite way that I can get, I can respond to that. I think. <laughs> No, I appreciate it. I really agree. I guess I was just in a spot where like, especially going through career lab, you know, I've heard people be like, you should be choosy with where you're applying to and where you get your foot through the door with. And then there's also people are like, just go for it, just anything, you know? Um, so I was just curious because I felt like this was a good environment to ask. Yeah, and I am very to... much. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, I you have to pick that strategy because those are those are two different strategies you have to pick mm -hmm. the one that feels right to you yeah, right yeah. if you are ready to just grind and grind and send the 400 um applications and interview and that's okay with you do it because there's definitely a numbers game that can happen if you instead it's really important that you find the right feeling you know, if it's, if you, you want to make sure that everything just feels right and it fits right. And that's important to you, then that's what you do. You've got to go with the strategy that matches you. Also, I don't think, and I'm, I'm saying this as a boot camper, um, it's your, one of your superpowers, like, yeah, sure. There's a bunch of boot camps and some of them are kind of garbagey and you may have had classmates that were just dialing it in and they just paid for the certificate, but you can sell it that that's not who you were. 
right? You came with all of your previous experience and all the things that made you amazing. And then you killed it for six months because boot camps, if you really do them, are brutal. That's why they're called that. So sell it, you know? And and someone who doesn't see that or appreciate it, they're not going to appreciate you. So red flag, red flag on them. Yeah, I love that sentiment that you just have to kind of decide what path you want to take because I'm sure you've heard me say it, Mira. I'm very much in the camp of like, when you're looking for your first job, maybe even two jobs, take whatever you can get. But it's coming from me who was like in a panic who needed to feed two kids who was like, I got to get my foot in the door because as soon as you get those experiences, you start getting almost like taken more seriously. And like, but it means you could be going into a really toxic year of your career. So it's like, if you don't think that that's where you can be or what you can handle, then don't do that. But if you're like, desperate and want to get the ball rolling then sometimes you have to other questions one thing I called I called these out in the chat but I love Lindsay I think you did a really brilliant job of demonstrating what these collabies could say going into interviews because you didn't lean on any like professional engineering experience you were like here's what I did in the collab lab and it's open source project and my previous jobs had nothing to do with engineering but you still were like give a really great interview and had a really solid answers to everything that showed me you'd be a pleasure to work with. So that was a great example. In my interviews, when I talked about like having to navigate this red tape, but wanting to make process changes, employers really responded well yeah. to that. And then using wanting to build things, wanting to make a bigger impact, if they responded really well to that. So that's when I kind of figured yeah. out how to finesse my story. I love it. Like rewatch this and snag some of Lindsay's language because it was great. And I called this out in the chat too, but the way EJ used cats, and like Lynn Tunk and that kept coming up. That's memorable. When you mm -hmm. interview somebody and they put something kind of silly in their stuff and it like comes up and can just be fun and makes it fun and memorable. And it's like just a little hack, a little hack to make the experience more pleasant because you need to stand out. Like a hundred other people are doing that exact same assignment. How's yours going to be a little different? So I thought that was great. Yeah. And your interview has seen, interviewer has seen it a hundred times, you know? So they're, they're not, they don't think it's sexy anymore either. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think both of you, my favorite part, um, and this was something that I worked on a lot too, is your questions at the end are so, they're such a good place to share what's important with you because what you're asking spotlights what's important to you. And then you get so much information back even if they don't say very much, because even that's a lot of information. If they just come back and say, yeah, our team's pair program sometime. Any other questions? You're like, no. Nah. But if you get your interviewer to go off on some tangent because they're excited about it and they love what they're doing, that tells you everything you need to know. So yeah, the questions at the end are really good. Great, great time to sprinkle what matters to you and to get what matters to you back out in their answers. I'm just noticing there used to be a session from Andrew on what questions to ask your interviewers. And I'm not seeing it in here. Have y'all seen that one? Yet? It, it's linked. It's just, it's sort okay. of like one of the documents it's in, it's in somewhere as just a gotcha. link instead. Cause it used to be a live session. Then it was an async session and now it's just a resource. Okay. Um, we should add that <laughs> as like one of the own. sessions that you got to do. Yeah. I'm going to uh, call it out in the chat. In the spirit of that, I, I want to say that if I had more time, I would definitely have asked Chris to talk about how his team um, mentors early career developers. Um, because, I, because one, I wanted to see Chris model that answer. And uh, also because I wanted to model for everyone doing this, that that'd be a very important question to ask as you're going into interviews, because you are those early career developers who um, would benefit from mentorship. And you would, ideally, you want to, work, want to work on a team that would value that and would, would give you that enrichment. Um, it's not necessary, I think, to having a fun time at a job. I will say I've worked at places where mentorship wasn't really part of the standard practice and it was still very, very fun. We were still very collaborative. But if you can get them talking about mentorship and how they work with early career developers, that's a signal that they actually know how to hire you and support you as an early career developer. Because not every team who's looking for an early career developer actually has the tools to help you feel comfortable and confident on, on their team as part of their processes. That's my last like soapbox for the day. Um, any, any more questions from anyone? I I had a question so uh, about the technical interview. So I was uh, so thank you for this great example of uh, what uh, we could 
possibly talk about. And uh, I, I know that it was an extended example, but if I'm able to, uh, so I'm just assessing my abilities and if I'm able to uh, talk about one tenth what was said. Uh, I, I never had the technical interview uh, experience, so that's why I'm asking. So uh, EJ talked uh, about many technology uh, possible and uh, many sides of uh, applications. So I, I can talk about something I know uh, and have experienced on, but it will be just not that long and a really small piece. <laughs> Yeah, I think well, that's okay. I go I think, with it? Yeah, talk about whatever you can and try and go in, in, as in-depth as possible. But I think when you're interviewing, people are going to understand that you're coming from a much earlier career perspective. That being said, like my number one piece of advice for anybody learning how to interview is learn how to say you don't know in a really humble way that shows you know how you can find out. So when they ask, like, tell me how you would handle caching for this app or whatever it might be, and you're like, I actually don't know anything about caching. I know that I've heard that a lot and it's something that I would look into. I think I would start by going and brushing up on what caching is and then using the understanding I have of our systems to figure out how I might apply that and then meet with a couple other people on the team to see what they think so that together we can come up with a really good idea. But say that you don't know, like in a very humble way, I actually don't know and be really honest about that you don't know it. But I would do this to come to the answer. Um, but come up with like, before you get into an interview, four different ways to say you don't know, and just kind of have it in your pocket so you don't like stumble and get awkward. Chris. I wanted to call out something that EJ did really well in the interview that I think y'all can steal. So uh, when I asked like, what would you improve about the product? Uh, EJ's response wasn't really an answer. It was actually a question. And it was a question that they would then direct to the product owner, like what is important for this app, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you don't have an answer, you can ask questions and get more clarity. And even by just asking those questions, you're gonna seem like you know more about what you're doing. And I mean, you honestly probably do mo know more about what you're doing because those are important questions that you need to ask like um, in the real world. So. Another example of that could uh, be like caching, you said, for example, is something that you wouldn't really know what to talk about, but you could think of questions to ask ab about the scenario to the interviewer. Like you could be like, well, that's an interesting question. How many users does the application have? How much scale do we need to support? You know, what are the requirements of the latency for that service? Those are all ways that you could just ask about like, what do you want from me without even actually really answering the question, right? EJ did a, 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 I think it was caching. Caching seems to be coming up a lot, but they said, um, I think Axios does that. I haven't done it. And then talk about the steps of how you'd find it out. You know, so if you've got a handful of, of tools and, and even if you don't, like, so, I mean, I don't know Axios, if Axios does it. So maybe I wouldn't say that because I wouldn't want to say something completely off the wall, but you can say, I'm not sure, but I'm, I mean, I know there's tools that would do caching. So, you know, is there something that we use as a team? You know, what can I research? Things like that, just to show that, you know, you can find the answer. Definitely. Cool. Well, we're at time. Um, there are great questions, great interviews. Everything was amazing. Um, I'm going to say go to the YouTube channel if you want and just um, search under Career Lab if you want to see more because um, we've recorded all of these sessions um, so that you can see different stuff, but also reach out. And then don't forget, this is just the first day in our interview week. So you're going to be meeting up with your peers and, and helping each other out and getting some of those questions and possible answers fleshed out. And then you're going to meet with your mentors um, and get more feedback one-on-one. -on -one. So you've got a lot more opportunities. And then there's always Slack. And EJ, I see your hand. Do you yes, wanna I just close wanted to say, out? if there are any questions that you have that we, you didn't get to or that you think of later, feel free to ask them in, in the, the cohort channel on Slack and Chris or I will be happy to jump in or anyone really here is welcome to also answer any questions that are mm -hmm. asked in Slack. But I like to record things in Slack because they're easier to read and find in the future than trying to go through a whole video. So if you do have things you yeah. want to ask, feel free to do that. I'm happy to come back and answer questions. Thank you. 
Okay, everybody, go have an awesome long weekend. And we'll see you next week. Bye, fans. See you soon. Bye, Bye everyone.